Welcome to Live from Jerusalem. Notre Dame faculty discussed recent events and their repercussions. Thank you for joining our event, which is co-sponsored by the University of Notre Dame's Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, part of the Kiyo School of Global Affairs, and the University of Notre Dame Aton Tour Jerusalem, one of the university's global gateways and centers, part of the Notre Dame International. My name is Daniel Schwake, and I'm the executive director of the University of Notre Dame Aton Tour, joining you from Jerusalem. Joining the panel from this part of the world are also faculty members and instructors at the University of Notre Dame Aton Tour, Avraham Avrum Borg and Sarin Nusaybi. Avrum Borg is an Israeli politician, scholar, and author of multiple books, including The Holocaust is Over, We Must Rise from Its Ashes. Avrum Borg was a leading member of the Labor Party, a member of the Knesset, chairman of the Jewish Agency for Israel, speaker of the Knesset, and an interim president of Israel. Sarin Usaibi is a Palestinian professor of philosophy with degrees from Oxford University and Harvard. He was a leader and activist for nonviolent civil disobedience during the first Intifada. He rose to become the representative of the Palestinian Authority in Jerusalem and then the president of Al Quds University. Sarin Usaibi has published multiple books, including the best selling Once Upon a Country, A Palestinian Life. To help us navigate through this, discussion and to ensure we're informative, challenged, and relevant, especially from our viewers from the US, we have Notre Dame faculty colleagues joining the panel from South Bend, Indiana. That is Atalia Omer and Asher Kaufman. Atalia Omer is Professor of Religion, Conflict, and Peace Studies at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. Atalia Omer earned her PhD at Harvard University and is considered a cutting edge researcher in the field of peace studies. Asher Kaufman will be moderating this discussion. Asher Kaufman is a professor of history and peace studies and director of the John M. Region, a junior Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. He received his PhD from Brandeis University and has worked at the Hebrew University um, in, before joining Notre Dame. His region of expertise is the modern Middle East with a particular focus on Lebanon, Israel, and Syria. We all stand full of horror to the death and violence in our region. In the current round of violence alone, 63 children have been reported killed. 61 were killed in Gaza Strip and two in Israel. I will obviously not be able to name all these children, but here's a glimpse, just a glimpse of what I could find. Yara and Trulka Kaulak were nine and five years old. Ido Avigal was five years old. Nadina Awad was 16 years old. Suhaib, Yihya, Abdurrahman, and Osama Al Hadidi, yes, all from the same family, were 13, 11, 8, and 6 years old. I don't think there is any word powerful enough to articulate our emotions when we hear of the death of these innocent children. May they all rest in peace. Irrespective of what the viewers now think in terms of who's to blame for their death, I truly hope. We all agree that their death is in vain and could and should have been avoided. In addition to these horrific deaths, we're also seeing violent protests in Jerusalem and the West Bank. We're watching neighbors turning on each other as mobs in mixed cities of Israel, threatening to tear that fine texture of what some have hoped to become the model of coexistence. In the midst of all of this, our panelist Avram Borg writes, there are people of peace everywhere. It's time to connect them. It's precisely now, out of the war, that this connection can be formed. This moment distills between the good of all camps and the bad on both sides. It must be transformed from a sense of individuals into a meaning, meaningful political connection. Avrum Borg's quote does not, does not come out of a void. It comes out of what seems like a deliberate philosophical worldview of hope. And I dare to say that he shares this notion with his counterpart from Jerusalem, Sari Nusaibi, who dedicated his autobiography to his father due to the sense of hope of the latter. Over the past few years, writes Nusaibi, I've, been, I've seen my share of smashed dreams, but like my father, I believe that human life is much more than the sum total of all our mistakes. Rubble, he used to tell me, 
often makes the best building materials. These two intellectuals are not just speakers of truth to power, considering the different power structures in which both dwell, nor do they just keep a Socratic notion of assuming their ignorance, not trying to explain complex series of events in retrospect. Most importantly, reading and listening to Sarino Saibi and Avram Borg is like inhaling hope. I've experienced this especially in my role as executive director, listening to Avroom and Sari talk to our students and program participants. We, especially here in this area of the world right now, clinch to such hope like a shipwrecked sailor clinging to a wood log, keeping him from drowning into the infinite sea of hopelessness. Howard Zinn had much better and much more powerful words to describe that notion. To be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It is based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, and kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we remember those times and places, and there are so many where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act and at least the possibility of sending the spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act in however small a way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. To live now as we think human beings should live in defiance of all that is bad around us is itself a marvelous victory. Please allow me to thank Avrum Borg and Sarah Nusai before willing to share their views with us tonight. I'm, great, I'm grateful also for Atalia Omer and Asher Kaufman who were able to magically find time in their schedule this week to join and set up this very important and timely panel. With that note, I wish us an honest, productive and constructive discussion. Asher, I turn the, I turn the word to you in South Bend. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for your introduction and for the initiative to have this uh, panel that brings uh, all of us together. In fact, faculty of Notre Dame here at the, in South Bend and in uh, uh, Jerusalem. Notre Dame is uh, in a unique position vis-a-vis -vis Israel uh, Palestine in that it is one of the very few universities that uh, actually have a campus in uh, Jerusalem, a campus that holds uh, vibrant academic programs managed by the university. Uh, Tantur, as we all know, uh, has also houses also a Christian ecumenical institute and plays an important role in the life of Christian communities in the land. And it also functions as a safe haven for Jews and Arabs, Christians and Muslims uh, alike to come together in one uh, really beautiful uh, space. Um, it is one of these sites in the country in which coexistence with all of its uh, challenges and contradictions is not an empty cliche, uh, but actually a lived uh, experience. One of the missions of, uh, the, of uh, Tantur, and I quote, uh, is participating in the search for world peace and justice through theological study and through exploration of human rights and conflict resolution in different religions and social uh, contexts. Uh, this part of the mission of Tantur is strongly in line with the mission of the Kroc Institute, uh, which also seeks to study human rights and conflict resolution or transformation in different religious and social contexts. I would like to add my endorsement, strong endorsement to Daniel's introductory remarks concerning the spirit of the conversation we are about uh, to have. In the midst of this wave of violence, we need to find the existing bridges that are still standing. Uh, these uh, people of peace that uh, Avram Burg was uh, writing about a, a few days ago uh, in uh, Haaretz. I hope this uh, conversation of us will, had, uh, will add uh, to this effort of uh, bridging uh, uh, building these uh, uh, bridges. I'll turn now to the speakers, uh, starting with uh, uh, the people on the ground, uh, Sari Nusebe and uh, Avom uh, Borg. Uh, and I asked each one of them to share with us their own thoughts, their experiences from uh, about what is happening now. And I'll start with uh, Sari, who I believe is in Jericho right now. You need to unmute yourself, Sari. Thank you very much. Yes, I came down today to Jericho from Jerusalem after about 11 days. I live uh, just next door to the area of Sheikh Jarrah, where there's been a lot of uh, 
trouble over the uh, question of the families, the 28 families, uh, under threat of being uh, thrown out of their houses. Now, um, uh, today has been uh, quieter, and so I decided I can give myself uh, time off and came down here, much quieter in Jericho. Uh, let me just say, first of all, that I'm uh, very honored, glad to be a participant in this panel, which I hope will be useful to your audience, to everybody, as well as to me, because uh, I also am in need of uh, finding answers to a lot of questions that are on my mind, as uh, I'm, I'm sure they are on the minds of other people. I'm very happy to be joining this panel with an old friend, Avram. Um, we meet uh, every now and again. Uh, when we meet, uh, I think we exchange uh, a spirit of hope uh, between us. Uh, I walk away feeling good that I've met him. And I have the suspicion that he has the same kind of reaction also when he leaves. Let me uh, uh, say one or two things about what I see happening. And I wish to uh, go beyond the uh, gruesome details and gruesome uh, views that we've all been looking at over the past two weeks, three weeks, to say something uh, more general. And what I want to say is the following, and I hope it will raise uh, questions in our minds uh, concerning what it is that we're seeing happening in, in front of us, what it is that needs to be done, what are the problems. Now, very strangely, I want to say that the recent events, the gruesome events that we've been uh, uh, witnessing over the past especially two weeks, have brought to the forefront, uh, in my opinion, three very basic and simmering problems that the Israeli-Palestinian, so-called Israeli-Palestinian conflict has had for a very long time. As we know, this is a, a, a conflict that's been going on for many years. One problem that it has brought out is Israel itself as a Jewish state or as a democratic state. The issue that was pointed out earlier, I think by Dan, when he uh, talked about the so-called social fabric within Israel between uh, Israeli Jews and Israeli Palestinians. Now, uh, what we saw, what we witnessed over the past two weeks or three weeks was uh, uh, an image where, which made us think that maybe there's a problem there that needs to be solved, that it was there somehow simmering underneath the surface perhaps, but it just came out. And therefore, long term, I think one has to address that and to see how that can be uh, uh, worked on in order to create a better future. The second problem I think it affronted, the events in the past two weeks affronted, was the problem of, um, of refugees. Now, it so happened uh, that the, uh, the issue when, when the, the trouble started three weeks ago, ago uh, or whenever, they started over the uh, area of uh, where about 28 Palestinian families who originally were refugees from within the pre-67 lines, uh, came over to uh, East Jerusalem, which was at the time under Jordan, which became under Jordan. Now, uh, with, the court, with the court problems that were taking place, uh, the issue was slowly brewing, and finally it exploded uh, in the last few weeks. And it was the issue of whether refugees can ever have a proper life. You know, having been uh, removed from their earlier habitats in what later came to be Israel, having come to settle in what then came to be under Jordan, whether again, they have to re be removed from their houses 
and removed from the houses where? Not back to their original properties, but somewhere else. So it created or brought back again, upfronted the problem of refugees. So, so that's the second problem, I think, that was upfronted. The third problem was Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, of course, uh, the whole thing uh, centers around the old city, and in particular around the uh, area of the mosque. Uh, and of course, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a very sort of uh, <laughs> a combustible issue. And again, uh, you know, it made us remember, it reminded us that this is a, a, an explosive issue that needs to be addressed. So what I'm saying is that in some roundabout way, the recent events, regardless of how they started, who started them, regardless of the consequences, regardless of the pain and so on, uh, brought to the forefront three underlying issues in the Arab-Israeli conflict, so-called, that have to be addressed, that people on both sides have to be ad to address. And I think until we address them properly, we will never be able to actually have a peaceful life in the future. I'll stop there. Thank you, uh, Sari. Avram, the floor is yours uh, to share with us your first uh, reflections uh, from your standpoint. Good, uh, good evening, good afternoon, whatever it is. What is there with you? Good afternoon, I take it, right? Right. Um, I'm so happy to be here in this uh, company of loved, I won't say old friend, because he philosophically will immediately say how you define old, but uh, I mean, all the friends, Sari and Daniel, which I see da uh, daily, and Asher, and all of you, and Natalia. Um, every day that I come in the morning to my cave, and I'm sorry, Daniel, that's my Aplatonian cave, okay, in Tantu, I say to myself, wow, I'm privileged. I live in, a, in an oasis of peace. And now at the moment in which at the back room, they discussed in, in the news, the terms of ceasefire, which means every side say we do it unilaterally, as if they don't talk to each other, as if they do not coordinate, as if there is no relationship. I do it unilaterally, you do it unilaterally, and then it happens, I don't know, somehow, I say to myself, there is no better time for the peace studies and the peace philosophy on Notre Dame than this moment. I mean, hostility is more or less over, a quarter to over. And soon we are about to talk about the post, uh, the post, the post uh, war reality, and that's the time to talk about it. Many people will continue to talk the language of aggression, aggression and the language of violence, because this is the lingua franca between us and the Hamas and us and some of the Palestinians. But I think that the challenge of an evening like today is to introduce a different kind of uh, syntax to the conversation and maybe later on build on it. What was this round? On one hand, it was a very old talk and very old fashion of mine is bigger. Mine is bigger, yours is bigger, my technology, your missiles, my missiles, I kill more, you kill more. Okay, we know it, we've been there, we heard it. The numbers are awful and the sentiments are very, very, I will say, narcissistic and self-centered. Palestinian counting their deaths, Israelis counting their casualties, and very few people, I will say, like us here, count the folly casualties and victims of both sides. Having said that, I have a feeling that we see an outbreak of maybe a new reality. Maybe, and if there is an outbreak of a new reality, can we trust it? Can we build on it? Maybe it's still a dune, still sands are not, are not stabilized, but let me try to describe the outline of this, uh, uh, of this new reality. I will call the first introduction for it, or the introduction for it, the Trumpism of the political science of the region. Came Donald Trump, the famous, some will say infamous, but I will say famous American diplomat, philosopher, intellectual and peacemaker, and said, I moved the uh, embassy to Jerusalem and I removed Jerusalem off the table. Yalla, no Jerusalem. Sari, you do not exist anymore, okay? Trump <laughs> removed you from the table, like a little bit of uh, some crumbles, but you're not there anymore. Came Netanyahu, like 
the best David Copperfield of the region, kind of a mentalist that can make realities disappear and said, listen, I have the Abraham agreements, the Abraham accords, and I made the Palestinian problem disappear. Abracadabra, hocus pocus, no Palestinian problem. All of the sudden I have something with the periphery, nothing inside, no Palestinian problem. And everybody applauded, the Palestinians disappear. So poor Seri, for the second time he disappeared, first as a Jerusalemite, then as a Palestinian. And all of the sudden, as eloquently as Seri described the occurrences of the last couple of weeks, it's all back. And it's all back big time and it's all back differently. What we see in this war is in a very violent way via missiles rather than via diplomacy, Gaza is well connected to the West Bank. No Palestinian national unity government, no national reconciliation, but Gaza and the West Bank are one as for now. The second is Jerusalem, as much as we Jews, Jewish Israelis would like to ignore the problem is the center of the epicenter of the issue. You cannot ignore it, not just symbolically, but politically and municipality and what have you. Then what do you see that not only Hamas is a kind of an offspring of the Muslim, the, the Cairo Egyptian Muslim brothers and the political Islam all over the world, it is also um, a very important religious element at the Palestinian, at the Palestinian uh, uh, side corresponds very, very eloquently and very, very interestingly with the more religious traditional elements at the Israeli conservative side. And the conflict that when we first learn what is it all about, at Sari's childhood, my childhood, and our youth as activists for peace on both sides, that we thought it's two national communities colliding, so let's see what we can do about it the conflict deteriorates more and more and more and more into the religious dimension of it. And last but not least, for the first time since 48, all the five components of the Palestinian split in a way begin to unify. Gaza, West Bank, Jerusalem, Lebanon, and inner Israel. All of a sudden, it's the same problem with different manifestations, but it is all of a sudden there. And now you say to yourself, if this is the new reality, on one hand, I can expect or predict that many of the right-wing neocons of Israel who were educated or conditioned or indoctrinated by Netanyahu's paradigm to see fear as the main driver of their philosophy and their politics, I see how frightening it is, how frightening it is. I see how troubling it is. But on the other hand, I say to myself, on the other hand, it's an opportunity. Because if this is the issue, we have so many interfaces that we didn't have before to try to unfold some of the elements of the problem. For example, within Israel, with Arab society, Yes, there are terrible issues that the Israeli government's neglected and abandoned and manipulated and actually gave room to crime family, to criminal families to run the shoulder in order for the state not to assume responsibility in a very, very cynical way. The same way Netanyahu and Netanyahu's cronies see the Palestinian Authority as a subcontractor for occupation in the West Bank they see the crime, the criminal families as a subcontractor to divide and conquer the Arab society within Israel. But at the same time, during COVID time and Corona time, we were exposed to beautiful manifestations of the intellectuals and the physicians and the pharmacists and the civil society and the municipal responsibility of the Arab society. And many say, a a a a a it's not a fifth column. It's not just the enemy from within, it's the real partner. And the potential for partnership is there within Israel. Many people in Israel say, not enough. We don't have a critical mass. We don't have yet a political power. It was not yet translated into political power, but many are ready to listen to the argument that says, even in times of war, it is not all of us versus all of them automatically. 
It is not a tribe versus tribe. It's not a genetic or ethnical collective versus a genetic ethnical collective. It's much more Hannah Arendt philosophy. I'm married to ideas and I'm partner with people who share the same value system as I do, rather than automatically belong to my tribe. And when you saw Jerusalem only yesterday, not enough, but some people going from Jaffa Gate to Newgate in a life chain of holding hands, Jews and Arabs together and saying, we are here to manifest in the middle of the war that we would like to see an alternative way of life, an alternative, uh, uh, an alternative paradigm for the existence here. You say to yourself, there is something there. My daughter-in-law, she is a family physician in Jaffa. She opened the clinic. She has Jews and Palest local Palestinian clients and patients do the shopping there. The kids are going together to school with pa local Palestinian kids, speak fluent Arabic since kindergarten and on. And you say to yourself, with enough seeds like this, all of the sudden, maybe an alternative grows bottom up that eventually will defeat the policy of fears of top-down Netanyahu. And I believe that this war actually pushed everybody to the extreme and everybody has to take kind of a position. What will be the right wing position? I know. It's a challenge of what will be my, my friends and my colleagues and my political side position. What I will offer them, what I'm offering them and what I will offer them and not offer alone is do me a favor. Stop counting states. Let's start to count rights and liberties first, because every individual between the Jordan and the Mediterranean has the right to have the same rights. Once we have this as a constitutional ground floor, the rest will follow. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Avram and uh, Sari, for your introductory remarks. We already have lots of uh, food for thought and continue the conversation. But I would like to bring in uh, Atalia to our conversation and perhaps also the United States. Uh, Atalia, you have been working, one of your areas of expertise is uh, US-based activism towards uh, this uh, uh, conflict. Uh, can you share with us your thoughts about uh, what is happening now from this perspective? Yeah, um, first of all, I wanted to express my um, Thank yous for being included included in this panel uh, with um, uh, two other panelists that whom I admire. Uh, sorry, we met a long time ago when I was a graduate student at Harvard, and I responded to um, a paper or a presentation that you gave. And um, and and you, I, I just remember one sentence that you said that you can't afford being an uh, being a pessimist. Um, and I've kind of carried with me, I, I'll never forget that uh, sentence. And of course, Avram Burg, I've, you know, I've been following you for a long time. So uh, it's such an honor You're to the be. One. <laughs> um, yes, exactly. Um, so I, uh, um, I uh, have prepared remarks um, uh, to respond to Asher's point uh, question about the, um, uh, um, uh, the perspective of American Jewish Palestine solidarity activists or relationship to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to Israeli policies and uh, kind of critical engagement with Israeli policies. But before I start, I want to acknowledge my presence on the traditional homelands of native peoples, including the uh, uh, primarily the uh, Pokagagan Potawatomi, who have been using this land for education for thousands of years and continue to do so. I start with this land acknowledgement because one of the hardest things I have, I have done in my life as an Israeli Jew <laughs> is to see myself as a part of a settler colonial history. Uh, this is not the same as saying that it's only reduced to a settler colonial uh, analysis, but I just wanted to acknowledge this. So today, May 20th, 20, 2021, um, as probably man, many people on this call are aware of, Senator uh, Bernie Sanders will be, uh, will be already introduced a resolution intent on stopping the US sale of $735 million in precision guided weapons to Israel, the same weapon that is being used in the massacre in Gaza. Sanders said in a statement to the Washington Post, quote, at a moment when US made bombs are devastating Gaza and killing women and children, 
we cannot simply let another huge arms sales go through without even a congressional debate. End of quote. Meanwhile, in the House of Representatives, there is a similar uh, unprecedented departure from a kind of rubber stamping arms sale and unconditional aid to Israel with outspoken representatives such as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez from New York and uh, Rashida Tlaib from, um, from Michigan. Uh, so AOC said, said it powerfully, uh, quote, for, decade, for decades, the US has sold billions of dollars in weaponry to Israel without ever requiring them to, res to respect basic Palestinian rights. In so doing, we have directly contributed to the death, displacement, and disenfranchisement of millions, end of quote. So this sense of complicity as taxpaying American citizens also animates American Jewish critics of Israeli policies. Now, uh, during the latest manifestation of an assault on Gaza, but also prior, especially in the past decade or so. So in my recent book, it's titled Days of Awe, Reimagining Jewishness in Solidarity with Palestinians, I trace the emergence and consolidation of Jewish American discourse that engages not only in an abstract critique of American militarism, and its global and international ramifications in terms of where American taxpayers' dollars are invested and what atrocities they underwrite. Uh, the American Jewish critics I, uh, are what I call are critical, also, uh, also specifically in terms of their Jewish complicity in the actions of Israel. In this case, war crimes and crimes against humanity in Gaza and against the Palestinian people brought in. So in the book, I highlight this as a process that I called critical caretaking. As Jewish activists who engage in Palestine solidarity and sometimes in what they term co-resistance against the Israeli occupation of Palestinians are fully immersed in a critique of the kind of hegemony of Zionist interpretation of Jewish history, memory, and meaning. But they do not remain only in the space of critique. Indeed, they cannot afford staying there because they are compelled to act as Jews against what is being done supposedly in their name as Jews and for their safety and or redemption. And this is where critical caretaking comes in. Therefore, um, uh, these uh, Jewish activists are not only critics, but also caretakers. The move toward critical resistance involves refiguring Jewishness as other centric rather than ethnocentric. Many Jewish American actors Critical, uh, critical of Israeli policies, and even con um, uh, those who consider themselves explicitly as non or anti-Zionist, interpret an understanding of Jewish liberation or emancipation in the form of an ethno-religious nationalism as constituting kind of the wrong lesson of the Holocaust or the Shoah. Critical caretaking means unlearning blood and land-centric conceptions of peoplehood and interrelated ethnocentric conceptions of liberation. So instead, Jewish critics stand metaphorically in front of the burning bush, uh, evoking the kind of the biblical image of when Moses was called to emancipate the, the Israelites from their slavery. The burning bush today entails uh, a form of recommitment to an intersectional conception of liberation, which also entail, entail liberating Jews and Jewish institutions from their ethnocentric militaristic prison. The image of the burning bush is indeed the logo of one of the groups I trace in the book. It's called If Not Now, which ex explicitly articulates kind of their own positionality in the US context of racial reckoning, where they interpret Jewish liberation as entangled with black liberation, immigrant rights, Muslim inclusion, Jewish safety, and Palestinian freedom. The name, if not now, of course, refers to the ancient Rabbi Hillel's three questions. If I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? The group specifies on its website that its understanding of this third question, if not now, when, conveys a sense of moral, moral urgency. The language of their, um, on their kind of self-representation on their website is as follows. Today, the Jewish community is faced with a choice. Will we choose a Judaism that supports freedom and dignity for all Israelis and Palestinians, 
or will we let the leadership of the establishment define our tradition as incompatible with our values? Will we continue down the path of isolation and fear that's destroying the lives of millions of Palestinians and alienating a generation of young Jews? So this sense of urgency also informs the current, the current today's mobilization of if, if not nows and other critical Jewish organizations such as Jewish Barcelona of Peace and Jews Against and, um, Apartheid, um, in, and also including non-Zionist uh, congregations or synagogues that emerge to the scene in, in recent years as a result of, kind of the cyc cyclical and cynical uh, uh, violence that we see, especially directed um, against Gaza and Gazans. So I will now offer just a very brief glimpse into the kind of Jewish or organizing and protest that is happening, that is happening before reflecting again on why what is unfolding in Palestine, Israel exemplifies a prison uh, within kind of a, a Jewish power ideology. As this is a script that the American Jewish Palestine solidarity activists I survey try to subvert. For example, again, if not now, is organizing um, this coming Shabbat, an action called Jews Against Apartheid, Rise Up Shabbat, which is meant to offer a Jewish space for assembly in DC, Boston, Chicago, San Francisco, Philadelphia, Philadelphia, New York, Toronto, and other cities uh, with a, the intention to express morally grounded outrage at Israeli violence and demand that Biden stop using our money to fund apartheid. On May 19th, 2021, so this is yesterday, young Jews organized a protest in front of the Union of Reform Judaism in Manhattan in order to show up and talk to the Jewish establishment and underscore that Palestinian oppression is not the path to Jewish safety. It's time for our community to reckon with the dispossession and displacement of Palestinians and to stop funding it. The group also started a petition for Jews belonging to the reform movement to encourage the leadership of this movement, which is very sizable, uh, to recognize, as does the Israeli human rights organization Betselem, the entire geopolitical space from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea as apartheid regime underpinned by a Jewish supremacist principle. What is implied here is a question whether those spokespers spokesperson of Reform Judaism sub subscribe to Jewish supremacy? And if not, what, should, what, what are they called to do? Also on May 18th, activists with Jewish Voice for Peace were arrested in New York City alongside many other, many more Palestinians and allies while engaging in actions of civil disobedience that included blocking streets of Midtown Manhattan in support of the Palestinian gen general strike that happened. In addition, Jewish organizations marked in different ways Nakba Day um, uh, that also happened during this, um, all, all the, that, the, the, um, the violence that has been unfolding. Um, and also one can see Jews participate, American Jews participate in vigils for Palestine organized by Palestine solidarity groups such as Students for Justice for Palestine, Chicago, which um, uh, a group that invited Rabbi Brent Rosen of Tzedek Chicago, a non-Zionist values-based congregation to speak and grieve together the lives, uh, the lives lost. Okay, so these are just brief examples to illustrate the level of moral urgency experienced by many Jewish activists and other Jews not committed to or not subscribing to the cynical manipulation of uh, the ethos of self-defense that Netanyahu and others deploy as a way to kind of distract people from the events in Jerusalem, including the looming dispossession of the families of Sheikh Jarrah, as well as Netanyahu's indictment and corruption and desperate attempt to stay in power. The current escalation doesn't only reveal the mainstreaming of Kahanism or the extreme ultranationalism, I think Atalia froze on us. Uh, so until she comes back, uh, I would like to give, I guess, uh, the two of you the opportunity to respond to each other or to Atalia's comments, which we heard uh, uh, until she froze. 
uh, Avram Osari. Avram, go ahead. No, I feel I like to listen to Sari. I feel a feeling of um, a little bit of uh, imbalance here. I mean, one Palestinian versus too many of us, okay? That's a very ethnocentric attitude, Avram. <laughs> So attitude wise, I'm a Palestinian, as you know, honorary one. Exactly. But, so, uh, I, so I'm not I alone like here. What, I, I'm not I like alone here. Him. Yes. I, I, just, I got just give one very small one. I mean, America is not very clear today. I mean, the United States of America is not very clear. Where, tr where Trump ends and Biden begins, there is no doubt that one of the achievements of the Israeli conservative government of the last couple of years that from a binational issue called the binational agreement called Israel, it became a bipartisan. It became very partisan. And we have to listen very carefully and very, I would say, happily to the new voices coming from the from the benches, not necessarily just the back benches of the Democratic Party. What Atalia said at the beginning, and this is the usage of American weapons should go to a larger scope, and this is not for now, so I just mention it. If you make the list of the best civil rights countries and governments in the world, you find the Switzerland, France, Great Britain, United States of America, Canada, and a few other places, and then you make the list of the most significant, important, largest arm exporters in the world, and all of a sudden it's the same, more or less the same people. And you ask yourself, what's going on here? They export their own violence to some other places in order to play and in order to kill each other, and they enjoy civil rights at home. And I say one of the, one of the missions in order to put an end to some world violence, and our region included, is to try to limit not just weapons for mass destructions, but weapons for mass destruction of human rights and civil rights, wherever it goes and how much profit it does to governments and profit it does to businessmen who support governments and to lobbyists, et cetera, et cetera. Having said that, we should put a kind of a policy around that no Israeli weapon can, weapons can be used in order to abuse or to, uh, to abuse any human rights and civil rights even around us and even with the Abraham Agreement governments, et cetera and no American weapons can be used in order to continue the, the, the oppression of the Palestinian people. Thank you. Uh, Atalia, uh, you froze on us and now you're back, so I want to give you the opportunity to conclude. I don't uh, know where, at what point I froze because I was reading my remarks. Um, I mean, I, um, um, in, I uh, kind of try to just give um, um, a sense of the kind of organizing that is happening within um, uh, um, American um, Jewish activists yeah. who see themselves um, as um, either uh, critical of Israeli policies. I mean, they, they are on a whole, on a broad spectrum with respect to their position on Zionism. Yeah. Um, I think we heard most of your talk actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, but, um, uh, but I, I kind of uh, concluded by, by, by talking about how um, they are trying to reclaim or reimagine a different kind of Jewish um, uh, uh, Jewishness that is very um, different than the kind of um, Jewish supremacist, supremacist framework that we see, um, um, you know, um, ever more pronounced um, right, right now in, um, especially, I mean, it's very, um, um, uh, kind of the Jewish supremacist framework was so clarified in the, the events that happened um, leading up to the to the escalation against Gaza uh, in 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 Jerusalem, I mean to have the Kanis, you know, the ultra nationalist um, uh, actors and uh, the, their convergences with uh, settlers, um, uh, violent settlers um, from um, from the West Bank, and of course working in, with kind of the, uh, collusion with the police and the security um, uh, the security um, uh, framework. Um, is very is a very troubling picture uh, that um, that that uh, many of the activists, the Jewish activists, uh, are trying to to put in as a mirror in front of the leadership of the establishment. Um, uh, is this what what you mean by Judaism? Is this what you mean by Judaism? And so these are the kind of dynamics that are happening. Thank you, thank you very much. I would like to ask all of all three of you a question that, in fact, you have I think alluded to this. Uh, 
question that I'm about to ask in one way or the other, and that is, uh, is this just another page in this 100-year-old conflict, or are we witnessing a watershed moment in uh, the history of uh, the conflict? Is, uh, are, we, are we witnessing now some paradigm uh, change, shift in the history of uh, this uh, conflict? Um, maybe I, I'll say a word or two here, because I think that um, in some way, uh, Avram was telling us that, there is, that this is a water, watershed uh, in referring to the five components that have come back together again in his earlier comments. And in a way, I was also trying to say the same thing by saying that the present events have upfronted uh, three major issues that, you know, the two sides have been fighting over, over a period of time. And uh, so there they are. Th these are the problems that are now facing us. These are the real issues that in the past, as you know, during the Oslo peace process, uh, these issues were pushed aside. They were not confronted. They were not dealt with. And uh, I believe that the time has come, perhaps, and uh, the events have proven that this is necessary for people to confront those issues and to try to address them. Now, the difficult question is, you know, are we going to address them? And how are we going to address them? Who will address them? And whether any difference will be made immediately or in the short term or in the long run? And if so, in what form uh, over time will that be done? Um, I think that, you know, we're confronted again with the major issues, but I'm not sure we still have the tools or the instruments. Uh, we haven't maybe uh, learned enough yet of our past failures to be able to deal with what Avram said, and I agree with him, is actually in, in one sense a new opportunity for us to try and push forward. So it is, yes, a watershed, but then again, it may not be if we don't actually do the right things. Thank you, Sari. Totally agreeing with Sari, I would like to add some more to the hip. There is no doubt that you know whether it's a watershed or not after, the, I mean, post factum, it's very, very difficult during the event to say, is that an historic moment or just a chronicle one? Having said that, I see a couple of symptoms that I ask myself, what do they mean? I remember only two, three, four years ago that the Qatar was boycotted by Egypt and by, by, uh, by the Saudis. All of a sudden, the Qataris are something else in the region. I ask myself, what, is, what are the relationship, the serious relationship between the Egyptians and the uh, Muslim brothers of the Hamas in, in, um, in, um, in Gaza, because in Egypt, they have a legal problem. They try to hide or to suppress or to prison or at least to remove them from the political system. Here, all of a sudden, you have a next door neighbor, which is a state or a semi-state. What does that mean? What does that mean that we have a reality in which in Gaza, you have a government which in the eyes of many, mine included, is because of its policy and because of its executions or, uh, or its, the way it exercises, it's illegitimate one. In Israel, you have a government which is illegitimate, not only because of the personality of the prime minister, because it is for, four, for, for almost three and a half years, it's not a government, but it's a government in transit. In Palestine, you have a government that was not, a, or a regime that was not elected. So you ask yourself, how can you do history out of politics that none of it is legitimate and what will replace it in Israel eventually will replace it something or somebody which is not Netanyahu who will replace Abu Mazen which is on one hand the last peacenik in the region and a very very serious one but on the other hand not exactly an open them open society in a very democratic one and there will will there be somebody who will replace Hamas over there so the question Asher the answer to the question of yours whether it's a watershed depends a lot of the outcome of the political system Saying that it's about the outcome of the political system, I will add to this one thing, which is 
a potential direction. I do not believe that everything is about politics. A lot has to do with the psychopolitics, politics, with the psychology of the politics. And I take it that the, the peace studies that you do over there, psychology is something very, very serious. And the psychopolitics of the region is as follows. When I come to my Palestinian friend and I say to him or to her, listen, I talk to them and say, why violence, why this? He said, you know what, in 48, in 48, you perish the history of Palestine. I mean, 400, 500 villages, communities were destroyed, removed, disappeared. And I say, and this is a trauma, he said, that's a tragedy, that's a Nakba. And I say to him as an Israeli, this is a strategy. Wait till you see mine, mine is bigger. And for 75 years, we have a competition of traumas. I deny his, he does not recognize mine. And therefore everybody says, no, 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 no. My trauma is bigger. The psychopolitics of a moment like this is to say both sides function under traumas. Let's not compare them. Let's not ask now who is responsible for 48 and 67, though I have a very good answer about it. Let's see from now and on can we create a reality which will look different? And I'll give you one example of what is a different reality. I told you earlier that my grandchildren are studying, some, most of them studying in a bilingual, uh, bilingual, bicultural, binational school. One day, uh, one of my kids came, my grandchildren came back home and I asked Yuval, what did you study in school today? And he said, well, today we didn't really study. There was a, a birthday. I said, wow, who, who celebrated? He said, Saba, Grandpa, Muhammad had a birthday. I said, wow, that's beautiful. What did you bring him as a present? He said, Grandpa, 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 not Muhammad, my friend who lives around the corner, Muhammad the prophet. And I said to myself, wow, wow, the grand-grandchild of my father, who was an ordained Orthodox rabbi, the, the, the leader of the National Religious Party, celebrates the birthday as a Jew, as an Israeli celebrates the birthday of the, of, the, uh, of the last prophet, that's a good beginning. And I believe there, Asher Dafka, begins the watershed rather than the top-down political one, at the psycho collaboration rather than at the political uh, split. I think both, both Atalia and the Sari would like to respond or give their own thoughts. So perhaps Atalia, because just to give you the opportunity and then uh, Sari. Okay. Okay, yeah, uh, I have um, so many thoughts about this and also, over, also kind of uh, reflections on what uh, um, uh, Avum just said about, I mean, I do think that it's very important to, um, um, to refrain from this um, victimization Olympics, as you uh, refer to it, but also recognize that the Palestinians who <laughs> became occupied did not were, were not the cause of the Shoah, of the Holocaust. And, and this is very important. And it's not like, uh, I think that uh, an opening uh, will be to stop thinking about uh, the histories and the traumas as a zero sum game. And this is part of the problem um, that, that, that they are. So, so, so here I go back on, to the very basic you know, work of Edward Said, but of course also um, a recent um, uh, work by Bashir Bashir and Amos Goldberg, this edited volume on the, thinking about the Holocaust and the Nakba uh, together, but not through kind of a zero sum uh, understanding of history and memory and think of it as a way of thinking of a different uh, syntax. For, 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 for the future. So, um, so, so having said that, I actually want to uh, reflect on Asher's question about the um, what's different or if it's a watershed and whatnot. So I think that a few, um, I actually, um, I resonate very much with the three points that Sari articulated. Um, and, and I think that there is something as many other commentators and analysts uh, indicate there is something that is different, uh, which really manifested in the, uh, the, the fact that uh, uh, we had, we saw the first uh, um, time of a general strike, Palestinian strike since 1936, uh, uh, which really ref uh, illuminates the fact that um, the policy, the intentional policy of fragmentation um, that um, uh, Israel has uh, engaged in through a variety of mechanisms um, is eroding. Uh, and with it, what is eroding is also um, uh, the, uh, the green line of 1948, 1949, as um, the green line that 
uh, is supposedly kind of a uh, geopolitical marker, but also um, facilitated a kind of a normative marker for especially the Israeli peace camp. That you know what is wrong is what happened in you know sixty seven the, the, those occupied territories through that myopia of the Nakba and 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 the, and the, the root cause of uh, questions of 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 justice. And I think that. It's a watershed event by looking specifically at the so-called mixed cities that of course they are only mixed because of the Nakba. It's not that, oh, here we are, we have this model of coexistence. They became mixed because of ethnic cleansing. Um, and the fact that we have an importation of um, vigilante uh, kind of settler violence that was always had kind of, uh, was uh, in, uh, involved the collusion with the security forces and, and the government. Uh, into those, you know, the quote unquote proper Israel um, uh, really is um, um, what is different. I mean, they, you had uh, people from, um, from um, uh, settlements in the West Bank bus to lead or load um, to basically engage in like, you know, <laughs> uh, lynching uh, and targeting Palestinian Israelis. Um, and, uh, and, and this is something that is really, uh, uh, forcing a different kind of thinking, and but 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 let's think about it constructively in the sense of, well, maybe there was something uh, highly problematic in thinking of the green line as a normative line, and thinking and that inform a kind of what I call a, a segregationist peace formula, uh, because that segregationist peace formula dependent on you know exclusionary understanding of citizenship, um, um, which takes me to to. Um, um, to Sari's uh, point about a Jewish and democratic uh, riddle that just doesn't work out <laughs> um, uh, uh, um, uh, through kind of a supremacist uh, ideological uh, framework. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Atelier. Sari, please. Yeah, yeah. so I'm, uh, I just wanted to say with regard to the uh, Nakba and the Holocaust, uh, you know, it's not the case in general that Palestinians will deny uh, or will uh, down downsize the, the the tragic, you know, uh, event of the of of the Holocaust. I, I I don't think they are you know connected in our minds. It's certainly not in, our, in my mind or minds of people Palestinians that I know and interact with. We recognize, I mean, we all know, uh, you know, that this horrible thing happened in Europe by Europeans against Jews. We know that. And we're not surprised that the Europeans have done that to Jews because in, you know, historically, we know uh, that there's been a lot of racism in that part of the world against all kinds of, of uh, peoples. Now, but this on the one hand does not make me accept having an Akba on my part. You see, this is, there's, there's a difference. I never, I never try to compare or to between, between the two things, but I think that, you know, however tragic that tragedy was, I feel that on the other hand, I've undergone a Nakba and the uh, Nakba was done at the hands of the pepe, very people who were, uh, thrown into that horrible uh, uh, Holocaust in Europe before. Anyway, uh, you know, just, just to let you know, I mean, for instance, I remember uh, when my mother was alive and sometimes we put on the TV and watch in Israel that, you know, Israeli TV would, you know, always show us the Nakba, I mean, the Holocaust uh, uh, story on certain dates, of course. And I remember my mother saying, you know, I, you know, put it out, put it off. I don't want to see it. And I tell her, why don't you want to see it? And she said, you know, you know, it's their pain. I don't want to see them when they are causing pain to me. It's, she's not saying that she doesn't recognize that the Jews have gone through pain, but she doesn't want to see that taking over the pain that is done to her. And, you know, she's gone through a lot of pain as a family, as, as you may know. But anyway, I want to come back to saying that it seems to me that we're maybe going around, at least in my own mind, I'm, I'm going around in circles now as I'm participating in this panel. 
I feel uh, I want to go back to one or two things that uh, I heard on the panel, including now from Natalia, but also earlier from uh, uh, Avram, uh, which is where do you start? So you have a you have a space between the river and the sea, let us say, and can you begin there from the bottom up with a with some basic principle, some basic human principle, say concerning rights, and if you can, taking into account the different uh, concerns and the different problems and the different aspirations of the different people there that are living in that part of the world, then the question is, you know, how do you go about trying to translate that basic human principle into institutional practice? How can you translate, how can you materialize uh, something institutionally based upon such a principle? And this is where we have failed. And I don't see how, uh, you know, Qatar or Egypt, or by the way, uh, to, you know, concerning Hamas, I think it's wrong to think that, you know, the guys in Gaza are just Hamas or that Hamas is just Hamas. Hamas is just a front and, you know, a lot of people are Hamas in that sense that everybody is unhappy on the Palestinian side with what's happening to them and uh, that's done to them by Israel. And all Palestinians, therefore, are at one at the moment in wanting to change the situation change the situation in the sense of, you know, creating a, an institution or creating a reality based on a principle of justice. That's the basic human principle that one wants to begin with. And how do you do that? Now, I don't see how in the, I, I wish somebody could tell me or help me think of how this can be actually done. I mean, okay, Abbas, uh, our Abbas, uh, say uh, Abu Bazin, uh, tomorrow is, is, is elected out of office, maybe someone else is put in office, maybe someone else's you know, elections in Gaza and Israel, but then what? How can we work together? How can we uh, use the, uh, the network that, that Avram spoke about first? You know, how can you create a movement? How can you create a movement that can actually impact the reality of politics? And the reality of politics is not something simple. I mean, you know, it, it needs uh, giants to move uh, politic, political institutions. And uh, it takes time. But even so, one has to try and work out some kind of vision. Uh, one has to think of stages, phases. One has to think of, you know, psychology, uh, economics, whatever. One has to put it together. And I don't think it's been done. You know, and uh, I say this out of uh, just knowing what people have been doing in trying to make peace or not make peace over the past 50, 60 years, 80 years, whatever. I think not enough work has been done and not necessarily in the right way. <laughs> and I think we are still lost. And I'm worried this opportunity that now exists before us, this opportunity in which we once again are are uh, made to see reality as it is and know what we have to face and know what we have to deal with, that we're not going to be able to do anything about it. I'm worried about that. Thank you. Avram, I see that you are raising your uh, virtual hand. Is, is if this... possible, very briefly. Okay. Series challenge is a very serious one and uh, are ready to give a direction <laughs> and to spend a couple of years in Indiana in order to flesh it up, okay? Having said that, it will be, I think, as follows, within Israel and between, and between the Jordan and Mediterranean, two different scenarios. What the corona showed is something very interesting. Jerusalem as a center of power, as a central government, got very, very weak du during the COVID. And in a way, we are witnessing a kind of a fantastic de facto Swiss, Swiss, Switzerlandization? How will you say it? I mean, Israel is becoming Swiss, Switzerland, Swiss, cantonized. Swiss. In Swiss. Cantonization, you mean, or Switzerlandization? 
in cantonization is easier than Swissization, whatever it is. <laughs> Cantonized into the Arab community uh, behave differently, the ultra-Orthodox differently, Tel Aviv differently, Jerusalem differently. And in a way, Jer the central Jerusalem is much weaker. And Israel during COVID expressed a very interesting uh, a very interesting birth of an idea of a society, not of a melting pot, one Jerusalem policy, but a country of all of its communities. We're not yet there. It's very embryotic. It's very, very early, but I see the direction. And if we develop this, it might give, among others, the Palestinian cause a lot of space for autonomous expressions between the Jordan and Mediterranean, unfortunately, with the same energy that people like myself invested so many years ago about the two state solution, I think it is dead. Oslo expired. And now the discussion is what kind of one state do we have? Is it a one state with two regimes, one full of privileges for Jews and one full of discrimination for Palestinians? Or will it be a one state as difficult as it is that looks differently? The ground floor will be the constitutional one that I mentioned before. Every individual has the right for the same rights. The mezzanine floor will be two political entities. In Israel, most of the issues of the Jewish political community will be resolved. And in Palestine, most issues of the Palestinian political community will be resolved. And on top of it, there will be a, a third floor. That will be the confederation in which the cooperation will begin. First, with infrastructure and resources and sustainability and all the other issues which are less controversial later on to education, later on for economic development, later on even to share power, and eventually to a full-scale three-floor confederation. Thank you. I... Uh, how do you get there? I have, yes. I how do you get there? There is a... a of years in Indiana. So I'm actually, as a, mo as a moderator of this uh, panel, I'm faced now with a challenge because we have about 100 questions. And uh, I can ignore them all together and let us uh, have this continued conversation between us or somehow bring into the conversation at least some of the questions and then let you choose if you want to challenge our room and actually come up uh, to show us how it comes up with a plan to achieve this. Uh, so some of the questions that we received is directly perhaps tied to the issue that you raised and that is uh, uh, politics, political leadership uh, in uh, in the country, both uh, inside Israel and among Palestinians, the question of the crisis of leadership on the Israeli side, Hamas is an emerging uh, power that uh, uh, makes a claim for exclusive uh, leadership uh, of uh, the Palestinians. And I wonder if we can speak about that part of the situation right now, and perhaps also if you are able to square the circle and answer Avrum uh, the challenge of our through thinking about uh, the political reality right now, uh, that would be greatly appreciated, I think, also by the many questions that we received from our audience. Floor is open. Go ahead, Sari. Um, so, sorry, I, I was, I was, I think, uh, thinking what to do with myself to get to smoke outside, I think. But what what would you like what would you like me to answer or address myself to? I'm I I'm I think uh, at least uh, a large part of the audience asked questions about uh, leadership in uh, Israel and uh, among Palestinians, and uh, I wonder if you can re respond to that the challenge of leadership on the well, on, Israeli on, and the Palestinian side. Well, I, I'll not answer on the part of the Israelis because I have uh, you know I think I'll leave that to Avram. Um, I think they've got a problem in Israel, but I think we've got a problem as well uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, for the past 15 years, I mean, I think somebody mentioned at the beginning of this panel that we have a leadership that's not been elected. Actually, you know, it, it was an elected leadership. The problem is that for the last 15, 16 years, uh, we haven't had elections. We were just about to have elections when uh, suddenly uh, Abbas pulled out and they, he pulled out by claiming that um, he wanted to be able to do it 
in Jerusalem as well, and that the Israelis were not allowing him to do it. But everybody was of the opinion that he was just uh, pulling out because he was worried that he will, uh, in fact, fail in those elections. Now, um, you know, at some point or another, you know, once the dust has settled, I think uh, there'll be another push uh, to have those elections happen. Now, the question is, will Hamas in particular as a movement actually win those elections? And my sense is they will probably have a good uh, uh, winning, but they will not have a majority in any future elections. Not that it will happen today. I mean, today, maybe if, if you go to elections today, you know, people are sort of uh, euphoric about all these uh, guns and, and, and rockets and so on. And, and they might sort of vote for a Hamas government. But I think, you know, in, in a couple of months time, when things have settled, people will come back to thinking about themselves, about their lives. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, there's a human cost and pain uh, for what's happened. And, and people will come back to this and will wish to uh, seek uh, means or, or methods to try and uh, regain uh, uh, the ability to live a normal life. And I think they'll go for elections. And I think the uh, national movement in general terms, that's the PLO, will probably once again be able to get the uh, majority number of seats in the Legislative Council. Now, whether that will happen, whether, the PL, whether there will be elections, whether the PLO will be there, I'm not sure. But certainly we are going to see changes in our leadership um, in different ways and over time. Um, and I think, again, maybe the strength uh, of any particular uh, political party that's going to be in office will be determined to some extent uh, uh, insofar as it is able or not able to provide the people with what the people will be wanting, you know, down the road. Um, that's on the Palestinian side. Uh, but, you know, again, to go back to Hamas, I want to just uh, uh, emphasize that, in my view, uh, the people that were fighting in Gaza against Israel or defending themselves were not just the Hamas movement, the Muslim brothers. There were different factions, and the factions sort of spread uh, between different Islamic factions, but also national factions and PLO factions. So it wasn't just Hamas fighting or defending itself. Uh, it was the people of Gaza. The people of Gaza are, you know, belong to everybody, to every sort of possible faction that you can think of, or factions that you can't think of, or no factions. Um, so it was a, a united uh, kind of uh, position. Now, that's as far as the Palestinian uh, leadership is concerned. Uh, I hope we'll be able to have elections. There's a lot of talk, I must tell you perhaps, that there's a lot of talk among Palestinian intellectuals about whether we need what has been popular so far as a leadership institution, whether we need the PLO in the form it exists. Because today people are saying, you know, the PLO went down the wrong road, they went down Oslo Road, uh, they've taken us to a mess, they made us accept the fragmentation of the Palestinian population, they made us forget the fact that, you know, our main claim, initial claim was Palestine, uh, it ended up being 22% of the country, so we need a different leadership, a leadership that will represent Israeli Palestinians, West Bank Palestinians, Gaza Palestinians, Palestinians in the diaspora. And, you know, it may be that there will be a push in the next few years, year, two years, three years, to try and create a, a kind of general agency, a Palestinian agency, which will somehow uh, represent the different components of the Palestinian population in the different parts of the world. But whatever happens, you know, we will continue having a problem about how in this country, in Palestine, between the river and the sea, uh, we will be able to uh, conduct our affairs, manage our affairs. Uh, I, I very fully agree that if you know, we have this uh, three-tier uh, system that uh, Avram just told us, if that can be constructed, it's fine. You know, I'm 
in favor of any kind of peace between Israelis and Palestinians based on the principle that he told us or any basic human principle that we're all equal. And then, you know, just let us know how you want to do the equality thing. Uh, I think most Palestinians are like me. I mean, I know they don't say that if you ask them, but I think deep in their hearts, people are like that. They, you know, they will accept anything if it is based on justice, if they feel it is based on a basic principle of equality. But how do you get there? I mean, it's not enough to say we accept. It's, it's, uh, there have been sort of offers made to Palestinians, Palestinians made to Israelis over the years, and they all look very beautiful offers over the years, but we don't seem to be there. And so we need a push or, you know, we need a miracle. I'm not sure. Thank or Notre you. Dame. <laughs> we'll go back to Notre Dame and the miracle perhaps in a few <laughs> minutes. Uh, Atalia, I want to give you the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, um, um, I think I, I wanted to respond to that point about um, um, kind of um, that image of this, uh, the Swiss, Swiss um, uh, of the space, but to highlight that it's very, um, uh, you know, this image is very different than what the reality, a reality that is actually manifest in what some people call the Hebronization of the entire space. So, uh, which again, we see um, kind of in action in the quote unquote mixed cities where, you know, <laughs> there is an effort to, you know, engage in an, another manifestation of ethnic cleansing. So, so this is the reality of Hebronization of the Jewish state law uh, that passed in 2018. And so very, very concerning uh, developments of that kind of an embrace and move away and move away from even uh, any kind of uh, lip service to that construct of Jewish and democratic. This Now it's just Jewish. Uh, we, you have uh, stronger and stronger voices that, that articulate this. Um, and again, it is, um, uh, uh, as the Bethlehem um, report, um, uh, it is one regime from the, from the river to, uh, to the sea that is, um, that um, is um, underpinned by, by a, a Jewish supremacist um, uh, uh, ideology and hegemony. And so I think um, uh, what, what I feel a strong affinity with um, kind of understanding of organic, uh, grassroots, bottom-up, um, you know, relationship building and, um, um, you know, that will be oriented by human rights um, uh, and, uh, and questions of justice. I feel very strongly uh, connected to those images. I think that what, like in terms of what needs to be done and how to get there, um, I cannot, um, um, I, I just want to stress to underscore the importance of in the international um, uh, international actors and their complicity. Like we mentioned the, um, um, you know, the, US, uh, US support, unconditional support, uh, and the fact that um, um, the, uh, we, we want to welcome the kind of um, um, shifts that we observed that I mentioned uh, briefly um, within the Democratic Party. But we cannot, I mean, the, the realities are such that, um, that people who are uh, oriented what, toward those possibilities of just futures, however they are going to be scripted, are completely bypassed by um, um, uh, Christian Zionist uh, lobby in the US that is channeling um, so many resources and, and also uh, uh, exert a lot of pressure on, um, um, on the American um, uh, kind of uh, domestically within the, within the US. And that has implications, direct policy uh, implications in Palestine, Israel. And so, um, uh, so, so I think that there are already uh, frameworks and discourses that, that help to think of ways to change the, 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 the conversation. For instance, the call of Palestinian civil society for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Uh, this is the very um, you know, historically recognized and admired modes of tactics um, uh, to, uh, to, to exert pressure to, uh, to influence change because Israel has been uh, engaging in annexationist policies 
uh, regardless of Oslo, and Oslo, of course, was a mechanism to entrench the occupation um, with total impunity. Um, and so, um, so the, 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 the fundamental change would be to, to happen in how, um, how this narr narrative is conveyed outside. Thank you. Um, we are at Notre Dame, and uh, uh, I think a large part of our audience is from uh, Notre Dame, and uh, Tantour uh, is run by Notre Dame, and I think one of the issues that uh, is really of interest to our audience is uh, uh, how should the, the university uh, respond to this challenge? How would the university think constructively about its work in Jerusalem, in Tantur, uh, in light of some of the challenges that we have discussed? And I wanna give the, actually the opportunity to, to I wanna ask Daniel to respond to that uh, question first before uh, uh, the rest of the panelists, since you are there and you are, uh, uh, you are our person in uh, Tantur, the university's uh, uh, person in Tantur. So Daniel, your thoughts about that? Thanks, Asho. Um, uh, it's, that's, a, <laughs> that's a very, um, that's a minefield there, but okay. Um, I think that, um, you know, first we are a university. Right, so um, we're definitely a place for academic research, for people to have discussions, um, and a place where um, people should be heard from even irrespective of their opinions. And I think there the university kind of already aligns with what Tantur has tried to be in the past and has been a refuge for these discussions and a place for people to voice different opinions. Um, the, the university is, is obviously also an American Catholic Christian university, um, you know, that stands uh, for human rights and for justice. And it is uh, its obligation as well to um, address and, and, um, and point to injustice if it sees it. Um, but at the same time, we're visitors here. Um, the university is not the land owner um, of this country and um, um, of Tantur. Uh, well, not neither of Tantur, but but I but I I, I would I, I think that is something that we we need to recognize uh, that the university is is a visitor here and the ability for us to um, um, it's 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 not our. Um, it's, it's also our duty to try to um, keep that Socratic notion of um, assuming that we don't understand what needs to happen. Um, and I think that we have a, a role vis-a-vis -vis our students, especially when they come uh, to this country, many of them after a week here think they can write a book and come up with all the solutions that are needed. Um, and if they stay for a semester, then that book becomes an article and if they stay for two semesters, that article becomes a paragraph, and then it basically vanishes with, with time. And then, uh, but but at the beginning, they do come with that with with that demeanor that you know we, we we've understood all the problems. We know who's the who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, and um, and, and um, we know how to come up with these solutions. So there, that is also our responsibility vis-a-vis -vis our students to try and. Hey, many people have tried to think about this problem, and maybe you you think you know the root causes of this, but how to come to that place is is completely different. Um, and and that's I think what links also with us here being a Christian institute in East Jerusalem. Um, we are the we, you know in the U.S. we like to think that we're part of the hegemony. Here we're part of the minority of the minority, um, so that 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 balance is is um, is important to remember, and I think that also gives us some excuses in terms of what people should be expecting us to do and what not. Um, I don't know if that was too vague, but I hope I hope. Um... Yes, 
Avram, I do not know if you were thinking about that because I know you spend uh, almost every morning working at the, the space, uh, the library. First, first I walk in and I say to myself, what me, an offspring of Jewish orthodoxy doing among 100,000 books about Jesus? But well, you know, <laughs> it's interesting, but I put it as follows. I think that the potential of the place is almost unlimited. It's an oasis, which is, Danny said, we're not the owners of the land, but in a way, it's a kind of a spiritual no man's land that both Palestinians and, um, and Israelis, both Jews, Christians, and Muslims can come and meet without the baggages of the political normalcy and the BDS, and you, and, and you name it. And therefore, the place has a huge potential. Only could we merge on site two dynamics. The first dynamic is the dynamic of your uh, Center for Peace Studies. And the second is the practical extended arm of the Consulium Vaticanum Secundum, which is the second Vatican uh, Council, which happened in 1965 was the resolution. Among, among other things came the Nostra Aetate and, the, and, and everything and bring together both the new church approach uh, towards conversations within Christianity, but between Christianity and other religions, Jews and others, and what you do there, and can have a center in Jerusalem that will be a serious educational think tank and think and do tank with your students and with the local powers, it might serve the inspiration, the inspirational side that Sari is asking, how will it start? It will start with a good think and good thoughts that this place can provide. And I know that under the leadership of Dani, a lot of motivation is expressed. Will the university come? Will the Vatican come? Will, I don't know. I can, show, I can assure you that once these energies will be broadcasted and radiated from the place, more than hundreds of Israelis and Palestinians will say, we're ready to listen. Thank you, thank you. So we have uh, really three minutes uh, before uh, our time is up. So I wanna give each one of you 30 seconds to think about uh, you know, constructive paths forward 10 years from now. Daniel, you are also welcome to join us with uh, your 30 seconds. 10 years from now, where, do you, where should, how, where would we be in a constructive way? Sorry, please. Well, I think, uh, you know, we'd be living in the country as equals. People will feel happy uh, with their lot, uh, satisfied. Um, uh, you know, I mean, you can't really create paradise on earth. But uh, you can come close to it. You can, you can do something that uh, will make people feel uh, that uh, life is, is actually not just worthy in itself for living, but also for enjoying as part or is, as, a, as part of a, as a component in a larger context. Um, and I think, you know, in theory, this is possible. I think, however, you know, I, I get the feeling just talking, I, I'm taking more than 30 seconds, but I just want to say that I think, you know, there are people of goodwill and uh, I, can, I can see you in the panel as, as belonging to that group of people. But, you know, I look a little bit more broadly and I worry that the world, real world is not run necessarily by such people and the you know it will take us longer than 10 years i'm afraid thank you atalia do you want to chime in yeah i uh, yeah of course i want to you know um i want to think of being a part of the of, of the space um, that will centralize uh, human rights and equal citizenship, but that has to happen not through kind of a discourse of myopia of of um, of pretending uh, that equality comes uh, from nowhere, but rather through a process of redressing and thinking of ways, concrete ways, to redress historical injustice that includes 
the, uh, thinking about the right of return of the refugees to go back to uh, Sari's, you know, one of Sari's initial points. Um, and so, um, so yeah, uh, thinking of historical injustice on multiple levels, um, I think that one of the, uh, the challenges for the Israeli Jewish society uh, is to come to terms with, um, um, I mean, it's not, obviously it's not one, one thing, it's not a homogeneous society. And I'm especially thinking um, of the constructive space that, um, um, uh, that Arab Jews or Jews um, that are not uh, tracing them, their, their, their roots to, um, uh, to, to Europe um, can, can help uh, in uh, kind of guiding um, guidance in terms of reconnecting to thinking about being Jewish in the space in ways that are non-hegemonic, in ways that connects to, uh, to cultural, linguistic uh, inheritances. You know, that actually for Israeli Jews to learn Arabic uh, will be a major step in the right direction. And, um, uh, and, 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 and also relinquishing the fantasy that Israel is in Europe. Israel is not in Europe. Um, and so I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Avrum, yeah. 30 seconds. Um, um, I'll end with my mom, okay? The reality will not be my mom's, will not be my mom's one. But if I try not to necessarily predict, but try to say what I want, I will say, I hope that in 10 years time, Sari will quit smoking and start running marathons with me. So I say <laughs> the first marathon Sari will run will be Bethlehem Marathon of 2031, okay? That's item number one. Item number two, I hope that in 10 years time, Netanyahu's trial will be over. Uh, having said that, now that we got rid of the two real main obstacles, uh, I will say the following. I, I know that we're at the junction. And since I'm an optimist, unlike my mom, and I said I'm not like my mom, I hope that in 10 years time, we shall see much clearly different partition lines than we see today. Today, the partition line, especially under pressure and under fire, is all of us versus all of them. This is what is seen. And I hope that in 10 years time, the partition line will look a bit different. Some of us and some of them versus some of us and some of them, which means people like Seri and myself can cooperate along so many things and so many practices and despite some disagreements versus some of our extremists and fundamentalists and their fundamentalists and extremists. And therefore a reality in which some of us and some of them versus some of us and some of them creates a different political landscape within Palestine, within Israel, and in between the two. Why do I say it? It's not unlike my mom. We used to ask my mom, mom, what are you? Are you a pessimist or an optimist? She said, moi, me? Of course I'm an optimist. Today is much better than tomorrow. I think differently. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You remind me of uh, Amil Habibi's very yeah. important yeah. Uh, novel, The Optimist. So, uh, yeah. Yes. The optimist. Yes. The, yeah. Yes. Optimist. Optimist. Right. Uh, Daniel, do you have uh, want to share with us uh, your own thirty seconds of conclusion? Sure. I I, I think that um, one one very important thing is for the people who want to be peacemakers is to uh, recognize that we we live whether we like it or not in a completely neoliberal world. And that is something that I think a lot of the non-peacemakers have understood and are using that. And only the peacemakers are able to use these neoliberal tools, will they also be able to play on a global level to make change. That change is not always very democratic in the sense of the grassroots that we've all described, unfortunately. But that's, these are the new games, the rules that we have, and we have to leverage on them. So I Thank think you. if we do, then this time it will look differently. Thank you. You opened a whole new can of worms by introducing neoliberalism, but that will take us to another an hour and a half of a conversation. So when, well, already time is up, so we have to conclude. Thank you all for your participation, Very particularly much. for those from Jerusalem. Thank you, Atalia, for really insightful uh, and thoughtful uh, contributions to our conversation. And let's hope that we do not need to meet again for another panel after another uh, 
violence, but actually our next panel will be about some constructive developments uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, thank you all, and thank you for those who attended and listened to our panel. Bye. Good night and good afternoon for us here. Thank you, thank you, bye. thank you all. Bye-bye, thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye.